that can be computed as 2 into precision into recall divided by pre, uh, precision cross recall. So now, what will how, sorry, I have made the wrong. Uh, so it is a precision and recall. If one of this uh, precision or recall will become equal to 0, then what will happen? This uh, F1 score will become equal to undefined. Right? So for that reason, we have to modify this formula that is 2 into TP by uh, something is there. You just have a look into the mathematics part. So in that case, we can able to compute. So that they are called your demerits of your F1 score, which can be overcome by Matthew correlation coefficient. So for that reason, the Matthew correlation coefficient have been taken. So in this case, there is a comparison of uh, the different methods, that is the deep learning based method as well as the proposed predictive net based method. And in this case, we are using some morphological pre post processing. Basically, this morphological post processing is done to smooth out the segmented image so that it will don't have any kind of outliers. This can be visualized from this uh, output image. So this is the input test images. So this is the ground truth image and this is the segmented image by FCN unit, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> segnet deep lab view as well as DTB. And you can see the difference of the segmented output for the DTB net as well as the other cases. This can be summarized by the help of uh, this uh, uh, training parameters as well as the two values. And the DSI value is found to be the highest in case of your DTB net. And uh, for Matthew correlation coefficient, it's also found to be the highest uh, that is near to one for the DTB net, but the other method, sorry. <coughs> So, in this case, what the conclusion we got? This case, we got that the DTB net have been used to localize the skin lesion. What is the importance of localization? The importance of localization is that we can segment the accurate boundary of this skin lesion. If, it, if I can able to segment the accurate boundary, then I can able to extract the features and these features which can be further given to a classification network for the classification. So this is the advantage that we got from here, these are the references, these references you can get in our published papers also. Next is called the tumor classification. Today morning I told we have developed four methods for skin lesion classification. One is called the hybrid based method, the second one is called the pre-trained network based method, then pre-trained network and the different machine learning approach for classification as well as the enabling of the potential strength of the different pre-trained network. And we got the conclusion in case of skin cancer that the accuracy is very, very less in case of skin cancer detection. But if we we'll use that same network for tumor classification, then the accuracy is found to be very, very high in case of your MRI images. So the same procedure is applied and for the brain tumors and we calculate the accuracy. So I am just going to the direct result of this. So if we we'll look into the confusion matrix of this case, you can see the difference. You have already seen the confusion matrix for the skin lesion classification by the different pre-trained network as well as the pre-trained network and different type of classifiers. So in this case, you can see the accuracy is found to be very, very high, which is greater than 95%. But in skin cancer, it is less than 90%. So from this, I can conclude that the network which can be used for one kind of task may not be suitable for another kind of task. So that means you have to design your own network based on the database, based on the feature, based on the information, based on the target, what exactly you want to achieve. So that is the conclusion that we are getting from here. You can uh, see uh, our uh, published papers in uh, case of the MRI that how the tumor classification is done, the details you can get it there. So next we will come to the glaucoma classification. What is glaucoma? So this is a, uh, another network has been developed for this glaucoma classification. Uh, today morning, uh, um, uh, Dr. Sarma told uh, that uh, we are using the retinal images for identifying the persons. Yes, nobody has used it uh, uh, in case of your real time as we are using the fingerprint regularly for many applications. We are not using the retina for uh, identifying the persons. It is only into the research or into the uh, movies. So what exactly it is and how exactly it can be achieved. So here we have done two things. One is called your glaucoma classification. Another is called your different feature extractions. And another is called your person identification. 
glaucoma classification and the feature extraction comes under the one group that is called your disease and identification of the different features and the person identification comes under the category of biometrics. matrix. So now we will talk about only the features, we will talk uh, if you want more detail, we have already published a paper on person identification from the retinal images, you can have a look into that. So that is based on hidden Markov model as well as the support vector machine classifier. So here we will talk about that how glaucoma can be classified from this uh, fundus image, but so you might have heard about the fundus for the first time, I just want to take you to the English literature. So what do you mean by fundus? A person is standing with a camera and the camera is facing towards me. So what exactly the camera is looking? The camera is looking to this uh, portion of this stage or person to me. So that means I can say the fundus of this room is this wall. So similarly if I will take a hollow organ like our eye which is just look like a ball and if I are looking from this our pupil then what we can see? We can see the retina and basically this retina is known as the fundus and what exactly this retina consists of? This retina consists of some blood vessels which can be easily seen by this red uh, uh, kind of uh, structures and if we look into very carefully there is a brightest region is present and this is called the optic disc and the center of the optic disc is known as the cop and basically this optic disc consists of neuroretinal nerve fibers and which are basically responsible for transmitting the neuroretinal that is called your uh, signals to your occipital region so that you can able to analyze it. If we look into this optic disc there is a heavy dark region is present this is called the macula on the center of the macula is known as the fovea. Basically the macula consists of higher concentration of cones and rods. Basically the cones and rods are responsible for your visualization. Cones are responsible for your bright vision and rods are responsible for your dark vision. During glaucoma, what will happen? Basically, the cop to disc region gradually increases. That means this is your cop to disc. Imagine this is my eyeball. So now due to increase in intraocular pressure, what will happen? This region will go inside. So that means this region will increase, but the disc is remaining same. So what will happen? The cop to disc ratio increases because the cop area increases. So cop to disc ratio increases. So people thought of identifying the glaucoma by looking into the cop and disc region. That means to, uh, by measuring a value that is cop area to the disc area. But there are certain limitations. The limitation says if there is some disc anomalies or in case of inflamed disc, the cop to disc region cannot be computed. That means the cop region can be visible, but the disc region is not visible. So you cannot able to identify the cop area to the disc area. So in order to overcome that type of difficulty, what we thought of? We have thought of proposing one model that is called your negentropy based model. You might have heard about your mean, variance, kurtosis, negentropy. This negentropy, kurtosis, these are called your higher order statistics of the data. So basically in this case we are calculating the negentropy, so which is nothing but a differential entropy of the features that is present in the retinal images. So why this negentropy is computed? What is the region or what is the idea such that we have computed the negentropy to identify the glaucoma? Basically I told the cop to disc ratio represent the cop area to the disc area. The cop area can be represented by the cop, uh, cop pixel probability to the disc pixel probability. Already I told you, in case of a glaucoma, the disc region doesn't affect, but the cop region affects. So the pixels in the cop will increase. So this can be represented by a differential entropy formula that can be represented by PC phi log to PC phi by PD phi. But PD phi is constant. So I can write PC phi log to PC phi. What is this? This is nothing but your entropy. And this we can say that is called your differential entropy. So we have made a relationship between your cop to disc ratio to the differential entropy and we found that this differential entropy is less than 0.25 for normal and it is greater than 0.25 for the glaucoma and this method provides an accuracy of 92.59%. So if we will compare this method that is called the differential entropy based method as well as the cop to disc ratio based method, so there is a large improvement between cop to disc ratio as well as the differential entropy. 
So again, we have tried with a uh, machine learning approach, which consists of a hidden Markov model and singular value decomposition. This singular value decomposition performs the work of your compression, and the hidden Markov model is a 1D classifier, which can able to do the classification based on the stage probability, and it will give rise to accuracy of 68.18%. So if we'll compare this uh, machine learning based method as well as the traditional based method, the machine learning based method didn't perform well in case of glaucoma classification. So for that reason, we have developed a 18 layer pre-trained network. And this 18 layer pre-trained network is consists of these are the layers that is called your input, convolution, batch normalization, ReLU, max pooling, etc, etc. And the last layer is called the classification. And in this case, you are using the cross entropy uh, or that is called your softmax loss function for doing the classification. And this network has been trained by the different uh, of, uh, parameters like hyperparameters, uh, epoch 20, gas size 32, learning rate 0 0.001. And we found the accuracy has been drastically improved for 97.8%. So if we look into the traditional based methods along with the machine learning based methods as well as the deep learning based methods. So the deep learning based method outperforms compared to the existing methods. So this network is compared with the other uh, uh, networks that is present in the literature. So we have compared with it, uh, Chen Itala, Juan Itala, Raghavendra Itala, Bajwa Itala, VG16, AlexNet, etc. And we found that this 18 layer network consists of least number of parameters and provides the highest accuracy compared to the other methods. So you can and this network also robust to the noises as well as this network also can able to use for each identification in case of your malaria parasite and already we have done one work and published that uh, how this 18 layer network can efficiently identify the malaria smears or that is called your samples uh, of the blood data that is uh, identify malaria or not malaria and this is robust for the other databases also. So, if we look into the number of parameters, the proposed 18 layer network consists of least number of parameters so that it can take least time for training as well as testing and it can be used for a real time glaucoma analysis. If we look into the other networks like Chen Itala, Juan Itala, Raghavendra Itala, Bajwa Itala, AlexNet, VGG16 and they have a large number of parameters for finding the glaucoma or non-glaucoma. So this is the thing that we have discussed and uh, I want to conclude my session here. So what we have discussed, the thing is that we are talking about machine learning, another is called your deep learning. The first point is that machine learning requires a feature extraction, deep learning don't require. It can able to extract the best feature out of that. The layer which is close to the input can extract basic features and the layer which is far, far from the uh, input can extract some complex features. Whenever we are increasing the number of layers, the more and more features can be extracted. And basically this can be useful for complex data. Whenever we have to design this deep neural network architecture, you have to be very much careful about the number of parameters such that your network can be trained with a less amount of time. The network which you have designed may work for one set of data, may not work for another set of data. So so you have to design your network in such a manner that it should be robust. Already I have discussed this thing in case of your skin cancer as well as in case of your tumor classification. The network which is not working very fine for skin cancer, it works very fine in case of your tumor classifications. So in order to improve the performances of this deep neural network, we have to use some pre-processing steps like your contrast enhancement as well as localization in case of your biomedical images. So for that reason, we have developed two deep neural network. One is EMST for contrast enhancement. Another is called your DTB net. And also we have discussed a robust 18 layer network which can be used for glaucoma classification as well as the malaria parasite detection. So whenever you have to design your own network, you have to make sure that which layer should come after which layer. That information you should have. That means the basic knowledge. And you have to look into the number of parameters, whether the parameters are less or it is much more than that. Whether the network which you have developed, that is robust or not, robust in the sense it can be able to identify the 
classes or it can able to identify the diagnostic information in presence of noise or artifacts. Whether the network which you have developed that can be used for only one set of database or it can be used for a multiple set of database. So these are the few things that you have to look into and design your own network in case of your biomedical images or biomedical signal processing. I hope I will come to the end of this session. So if you have any queries, any questions, uh, please you can ask. And whatever the things I have discussed, all the things have been presented in uh, at least minimum two or three papers of our work. So you can see our uh, that publications and you can get the details. The codes are available in the GitHub website. Databases are available. You can download the database, download the code. You can do your own experiment and see whether we are getting that result or not. So anything you Might have a question, may not want to ask, but you can drop a mail to me because your question help me to think much better for my research. Because you are the people for which we the researchers are, uh, that means, uh, uh, explore more things. Because the idea come to you first, then we are exploring that one, we are trying to analyze that one. One thing I want to tell, that is uh, told to my, uh, by my teacher, a teacher is recognized by his students, not by his work or anything. So if a student is good, if a student is doing some good work, the teacher is automatically recognized in the, or in the whole world. So you are the, I am not saying you are my students. I am saying that whatever the things I have delivered to you, it may impact at some part of your brain, it may give some new ideas or generate some new ideas, that new idea may not work out, but that idea will give rise to or it will be the mother of many other ideas on which the researcher group or the peer group can work and get some good results. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Hello, hello. Sir, good afternoon, sir. I have a question. Yes. So, myself, uh, from EC. Actually, for example, if you take uh, uh, brain images or we can take uh, like uh, cervical cancer images, so there are variety of uh, images we are analyzing. So, normally, uh, the parameters we are uh, taking like uh, sensitivity, then accuracy, uh, then uh, some other uh, things uh, we are taking for analysis. Yes. So, uh, can you list out apart from these parameters, what are all the parameters we can take uh, for our uh, research purpose? Uh, any uh, new parameters we are having? Uh, like, uh, can you I give told, some idea? Yeah. Yes. As I told, accuracy. Accuracy basically depends upon true positive plus true negative divided by the true positive, true negative, false positive, and false negative. Right? It will only classify how many number of correctly classified samples, but it will not tell about that how many number of uh, positive samples from the total positive is get classified. So for that reason, people have developed this F1 score. F1 score measures the harmonic mean between the precision and recall. So it can be computed by uh, 2 into precision into recall divided by precision plus recall. The disadvantage in that case is that if we will become precision is 0, or recall is zero, uh, or both are zeros, then what will happen? It will become equal to infinite. You cannot able to define your F1 score. So for that reason, people have thought of that F1 score computed by 2 into TP by something, such that this parameter will not zero. In F1 score, there is another disadvantage that it is not symmetric. 
what is symmetric suppose i have taken one class is positive another class is negative and i will got the confusion matrix and based on that confusion matrix i have computed my f1 score now what i will do the negative class which i have taken i will make it to positive class and the positive class which i have taken i will make it to negative class but the values of the confusion matrix will change because now it will become positive negative because it is swapped so when it is swapped your f1 score will change so that means it is not symmetric but the same classifier you are using so f1 score will change so in order to overcome that type of difficulty people have thought of matthew correlation coefficient that is known as your mc this mcc is called symmetric that means whether you are taking the positive class negative class or you will swap it so you will get the same matthew correlation coefficient again advantage of matthew correlation coefficient is that it will find the correlation between the true positive to negative false positive as well as false negative such that it will give the range from minus 1 to 1 which is present in case of your f1 score that is 0 to 1 so uh, in case of matthew correlation if there is a complete correlated complete correlated means correct classification is done for the positive classes and correct a negative class uh, classification is done for the negative classes so you will get the highest value that is equal to plus 1 and for other cases you will get the least value that is called your minus 1 so matthew correlation coefficient is the best measure for this case people have thought of kappa score that kappa score didn't give the best result uh, or best uh, uh, comparison of the correctly classified as well as the uh, correctly excluded apart of that people have thought of dice similarity index which also gives a better result for the correct classification as well as the incorrect classification so this uh, total information is present in our uh, published papers so have a look into that the comparison of this yes we have uh, used, uh, our own network that is the 18 layer pre 18 layer network that we have developed we have developed two networks one is 18 layer network which can work fine for the malaria parasite as well as the glaucoma images and another 24 layer network that we have developed that is for covid 19 so it is working fine for COVID-19 as well as meat classification. Meat classification is a problem which basically uh, tells about the quality of a meat based on the, uh, that is visualization. So that is working fine for this meat classification. Yes. Yeah, already uh, the morning sir has told there are two things. One is called your reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning sir has told. Yeah, what exactly reinforcement learning? No. Yeah, in case of supervised uh, learning process, unsupervised learning process, yeah. So already we have a, a supervised model is there. Already you have some data based on that you can get a supervised model. So after that you can use that unsupervised training or unsupervised uh, uh, that is called your classifier, the classification. Not getting? No. Yeah. Unsupervised that is your clustering. Your clustering. Clustering is nothing but a unsupervised learning. Basically, we are using K nearest neighborhood, or we can talk about K nearest neighborhood is called a supervised. But K means clustering is a unsupervised one. K means clustering. K means clustering means you have to decide what is the value of K for performing the work of your clustering. So basically, for clustering, how many number of cluster required? That information you should have. Otherwise, you cannot make the clustering. Suppose you have a, an image in which there are you are looking for two clusters, or you are looking for the four clusters. So that information you should have prior, then you can make it to a two cluster or a four cluster. So for that reason, you are a supervised one. So this four cluster or two cluster, that is called your prior knowledge. So after that, you can use that K nearest neighborhood, that is K means clustering for doing this clustering.
performance measures you want uh, yeah yeah you can calculate the distance measure you can calculate the distance measure for clustering oh you want to learn uh, yeah yeah uh, that you can go uh, to the books or you can see some search paper Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is get from that is the best uh, uh, sources available for our research community. Books are also there. So you just have a look into the research paper. Yeah, yeah. I will share to sir, uh, Dr. Safik sir, or I can share to the HOD, madam, right? And I have I can call. Thank you, sir, for clarifying the doubts. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest, Dr. M. Sabarimalai Manikandan. He is a highly accomplished individual with a long list of achievements and accolades to his name. Dr. M. Sabarimalai Manikandan has been recognized for his outstanding contributions in the field of biomedical engineering, receiving the 2019 CVET Most Cited Article Award at the Biomedical Engineering Society Conference, Philadelphia, USA, and the 2019 IET Healthcare Technology Letters Premium Award. He has also been awarded at 2012 for Outstanding Performance Award and Employee of the Month during his tenure at Samsung India Electronic Private Limited. Currently, he holds several important positions in the field of standards development. He is the chair of Cardio Respiratory Subgroup of IEEE Standards P1752.2 and the vice chair of Working Group of IEEE Standards P2520.3.1. Additionally, he is a member of Working Group of IEEE P1924.1 where he has made significant contributions in the recommendation of sensor and data acquisition techniques. His expertise is widely recognized and he serves as an associate editor of IEEE Access, Healthcare Technology Letters, IET Generation, Transmission and Distribution, Loss Digital Health and Frontiers in Signal Processing. He has also served as an academic editor and guest editor of Journal of Healthcare Engineering. Dr. N. Sabarimalai Manigandan is highly respected reviewer for reputed journals including the IEEE, ACM, IET, Springer, Elsevier, PLOS One and Taylor and & Francis. It is indeed an honor to have Dr. M. Sabarimalai Manigandan among us today and we look forward to learning from his wealth of knowledge and experience. Now, with immense honor and privilege, we would like to invite Dr. M. Sabarimalai Manigandan, Associate Professor, Department of Electrical Engineering, Indian Institute of Technology to take over the session. So, 
very good afternoon to all. So, uh, after a heavy lunch, I will introduce the basic concept of signal uh, processing so that it will not be any problem. And also, please do not sleep and do not discuss, do not disturb. That is most important when whenever you attend some presentation. And most of the time, the presentation will be different. Means we studied many topics in the classroom, we got good marks in the exams, but we do not know till how to apply the basic concept that we studied in the classroom. So, this presentation is mainly focused on the basic concepts of data acquisition, it is based on the compressed sensing and sparse signal decomposition method with the focus of uh, biomedical signal analysis. So, uh, just uh, uh, there are many types of signals that that you can sense from a human body and including cardiac signals which includes electrocardiogram, phonocardiogram, then photopolystomogram, then brain signal, electromyogram, then uh, seismic cardiogram, ballistocardiogram. There are many types of signals that can be sensed from a human body by using non-invasive sensors, very important, by using non-invasive sensors. Just place a sensor on your body and you will get your all variety of biomedical signals. Why do you want to sense the signal? Uh, we like to sense the signals because we want to understand the function of your system which we studied the third semester signals and system. Okay? There is a system to understand the function of the system. There are many types of organ system in your human body without opening the organs of the body or anatomical structure of the system. And we would like to sense the, the normal and abnormal function of the different kinds of organs by using non-invasive. So now, if you see uh, uh, today, the main focus will be based on uh, the EEG signal, uh, which is extensively used for uh, studying the function of your neurons, neural activities. Like we want to study the function of the heart organs, we record EEG signal. E indicates the electrical signals because uh, we use a, a different kinds of sensor for sensing biomedical, but based on electrical phenomena that is called physical variable. In this case, the physical variable is the electrical quantity and by using electrodes, okay, that is why we will say electro encephalogram that means the graph and encephalo indicates the our neuron potentials, particularly electrocardiogram, electro uh, myogram that is called muscle artifacts. So now, uh, if you want to see uh, uh, application of EEG signals, human brain consists of millions of neurons which are playing an important role for controlling behavior of your human body with respect to the internal, external motor sensory units. So now, we know the definitions. Now, what are the sensors that will be used? So here, I can use wired based sensor to acquire a EEG signal. I can use wireless sensor also to acquire EEG. So there are some applications we need to use wireless sensor. The recent advancement in EEG signal processing is brain to brain communication. The open research topic today, may most of the pro uh, professors in the world are focusing the brain to brain communication. That means I will use my brain to control the brain of somebody okay, by sending a signals. So now. In these cases, if I want to work in the field of brain to brain communication or brain to machine communications or brain to machine interface, which is, ex, uh, is a, what is called uh, recent studies, there they use a wired sensor. That means what you have electrodes, that is most of the time the electrode is like, like a AG, AGCL electrode, which is used to capture the electrical potential. Because the human body, you have many potentials, one is action potentials. Okay, then nerve, nerve action potential, cardiac action potential. So here we are talking about the nerve action potential. Therefore, the second is point, neurons will act as a information carriers between human body and brain. The neuron action potentials. So you, when you touch a heat surface or a heat body and you will immediately sense and immediately take the finger. So that means what? Sensation means stimulate a, a propagation of your action potential from one point to the brain cell. Okay, that is why it we say carries the information and the 
nerve action potential action potential will be very small durations as compared to the cardiac action potential there is a difference because the cardiac action potential we have to see a four chambers so each of the chambers perform some collection of the blood and pump the bloods of the rest of the body and the bloods the lungs for the purification so now if you see that neurons will act as a information carriers and now you can also see that whatever the actions that i am doing now may be autonomous actions and it's not it, we can say you cannot control some persons when they talk they may use some hands gestures to indicate the percentage it comes autonomously so that means what if i lift my hand i want to lift the hand of another person i can use brain signals in such a cases we like to use wireless e so if i say that i want to use wireless e electrodes for collecting e well, then we must concentrate how to energize such a wireless devices because i am carrying a set of wireless devices which can be useful for controlling the function of the other object or controlling the function of the other organs of the same subject so in this cases we have to energize all wireless sensor whenever whenever you consider that monitoring is based on the wireless sensor and you can see most of the wearable devices portable devices are limited with the battery power so that means how do you energize or how do you replace the battery it will be what the, sometimes if you say continuous monitoring then you have to replace the battery frequently it will be more annoying for the subject or the users so therefore we have to identify the mechanisms to improve the energy efficiency of such a wireless e electro or wireless e g sensing system so what are the way to improve or or improve the energy efficiency of wireless e g uh, systems that is one the one of the ways reducing the number of samples that need transmitted to the transmitted from one subject to another subject or a one person to another subject or from one person to a machines but we studied that we must follow a nyquist rate or nyquist sampling rate to acquire a biomedical signals or any signals we studied in a third year okay or no, sorry in second year subject or third year subject probably in digital signal processing signal system we studied that that the minimum sampling rate will be 2 into f max the where f max is the highest frequency component that present in the signals so let us assume that eeg signal has a highest frequency of 100 hertz so you must choose 2 into 100 to acquire a or to convert that analog signals which is comes from the ecg eeg electrode to digital signal so minimum sampling rate need to be maintained so now if i want to uh, collect a signals with the nyquist sampling rate then you can find that the more number of samples will be generated even if you want to analyze a delta wave beta wave that will have a lower frequency as compared to a gamma wave so now based on the frequency information or frequency content of a signal that need to be transmitted or processed we must choose a sampling rate that's a one one way to reduce the energy consumption or one way to improve the energy efficiency based on based on the frequency content or based on the signal of interest that need to be processed or transmitted but eeg signal can have many brain waves but for a specific applications you want to perform a yeah, uh, what what you want to detect or extract only the delta wave or theta wave now delta wave theta wave frequency range will be different which will be lower than the frequency range of the gamma wave that means what i should have some knowledge about the signal to be processed or transmitted to choose the sampling rate okay. why do you want to choose the sampling rate because you are going to produce more number of samples if it more sampling rate that may increase the energy consumption and that can reduce the lifetime of the battery it will be embedded with the your portable device or wearable devices so if i can choose the sampling rate based on the frequency content that need to be processed or transmitted i can reduce the energy consumption of the any kinds of wearable devices or wireless sensing mechanism so that's the one of the things that we need to consider now if i see this graph okay this chart it has a uh, type of the brain waves the gamma wave beta wave alpha wave theta wave and delta wave so we'll start from here that 1 to 4 hertz will be the delta wave 4 to 8 hertz will be the theta wave and 8 to 12 hertz will be alpha wave 
and 13 to 30 hertz will be a beta wave and higher than the 30 hertz it is a gamma wave. So, this information we must know. So, instead of knowing the characteristics of the signal, we cannot provide a, a innovative solution for any kinds of research problems. So, first you must know the characteristics of the signal to be processed or analyzed. So, I want to work in EEG signal processing applications or EEG based any kinds of a system, I must know what, the, what is the frequency range of each of the brain waves. So, now I know the frequency range of uh, each of the brain waves and also I know the important application of each of the brain wave. For example, uh, if we extract the delta wave, then we can detect a, a deep sleep stage. Deep sleep, that means what? If so, some many many of the research groups are working. If you are, that is called driver drowsiness detection. While while driving the vehicles, if somebody is sleeping or particularly driver is going closing eyes and going to sleep mode, and if you have wireless EEG, that I want to stress, work with any wired based EEG signal, but it's not compatible for many of the applications for the users with the many of the applications. Particularly driver case, he cannot use always wired. So we can have wireless EEG system, but that limited battery power. So, we should have mechanism to charge that wireless EEGs also. That is one of the things the previous. So, now if I say that if I, if I have signal processing techniques accurately extract this delta wave from the EEG signal, then I am able to detect the, the deep sleep stage. Or if I want to extract, if I can extract the delta wave, then I can go to the another light sleep, then relaxed mode, then active modes. So, these are the most essential information want to work with the test system, okay. So now, uh, before uh, as you know that you have sensors, most of the time we buy and we have or we can say I have the facility to record my EG signal both wired way, wireless way and now we must understand the what are the different types of characteristics. This, this slide is most important, single slide is sufficient to understand the entire signal processing based systems. So, what are the uh, signals you studied in signal system course? Deterministics and random signals. But we studied deterministics, but most of the applications we can see only random signals. Okay, we can see only random signals. Now, I, I have set of signals. How do you say that these type of signals are random signals? These type of signals are deterministic signals, which are based on the statistical parameters. This is most important. We used it in a probability theory and random process. We will study a set of statistical measures or metrics or we can say parameters which is used for characterizing a random signal because random signals cannot be modeled with a mathematical expression. All the deterministic signals can be modeled with a mathematical expression or we can say I can predict the future samples of a deterministic signal with zero error, but we cannot able to predict a, a future samples of a random signal based on the first 10 samples or a 5 samples or n number of samples without any error. That means what? All the random signals can be characterized by using statistical parameters. Therefore, we studied mean, variance, standard deviation or we can say courtesies and skewed. Each of these statistical parameters has some meaning. The mean can be used for classifying a group of uh, signals. Variance can be used for classifying a group of signals. The courtesies is nothing but what? which can be used for classifying a group of signal and the skewness can be used for classifying a another group of signal based on the symmetry of the distribution. That means what? For after collecting a signal in general which is called time series, we always take a distribution in the sense histogram of a signal. That means your sensor, basically sensor produces samples within some range. Let us assume that range is from minus 10 to uh, plus 5. Now, I will I will just obtain the histogram, then after uh, what is called generating the histogram for a, a single source, you can see the type of the distribution. Now, I know the type of the distribution based on my perception because I already trained that uniform distribution means looks like this, Gaussian distribution like this and Laplace is peaked at the 0 to B and then we study many more distribution. But how do you make a system to understand the distribution of a source? that is based on the statistical parameters. So, if I say that is a Gaussian distribution which will have a specific value for value of a cortosis or if we consider a flat distribution nothing but uniform distribution, then it will have a different uh, mean 
or you can say variance tuners and kurtosis. So therefore, these four statistical parameters are most important characterize any type of random signals comes from the human body or you can say most of the signals or all the signals from the human bodies are random signals, random signals. So now, how to test the randomness of a signal? Easiest way to check the randomness of the signal based on number of turning points. It is the best method You collect any signals to try to get the turning points, okay? to try to get the number of turning points and based on that number of turning points, you can say the complexity of a random signal, whether it is a highly randomness or a or weakly random signals. In some cases, we can see highly random signals. For example, the noise which are produced by uh, by the or, or we can say flow of electrons in a semiconductor devices is a, a highly random signal. It can say sometimes thermal noise, the white noise, which means it contains all the frequency components. The number of electrons flowing through that semiconductor device with respect to time will vary. It will be different. Okay. So based on the number of electrons only, we know amplitudes. We can easily correlate. Okay, if more number of electrons, the, we can have some example more amplitudes, the less number of electrons, less amplitude or we can say current. So, that means what? It is a time varying phenomena, time varying phenomena. So, now to check the randomness, we use the number of turning points. Before uh, understanding that what is called what type of features that need to be extracted by using signal processing technique, we must know uh, some more classification, one is called stationary random signals or we can say non and non stationary random signals. So, now if I uh, then further we have quasi random sig quasi stationary signals and cyclo stationary signals. So, now any class of a signals will be in this category non stationary signal, quasi stationary signal, cyclo stationary signal. So, now if you look at this uh, signal comes from the heart which is called a heart sound signal, there is a lap sound, dub sound, lap sound, dub sound. Now, if I take a one cycle of this sig uh, signal, then I have lap and dub, then again I have lap and dub. That means what? The same pattern is repeated in a cyclic manner. That means what? We are going to see the only cycle period. So, one cycle period if I assume that 500 millisecond, within the 500 millisecond, I can see a lap and dub sound, then same lap and dub sound is repeated for a given observation interval, which may not be true for next observation interval. So, therefore, whenever you want to classify signals into any one of this category, you must assume what is your observation interval. So, within this observation interval, for example, 10 seconds, I can say that all 10 cycles will be repeated. Therefore, this type of signal is example for cyclostationary. One can, ask, one can ask me, why do you want to know cyclostationary? That is interesting. So, if you know that it is signal is a periodic or you can say within the observation interval, the cycle is repeated, then you must know what type of uh, Fourier tool has to be used for this. You studied many things, the so Fourier transform, Fourier series with respect to discrete time and continuous time. So, we say that Fourier series extends for a periodic signal analysis where we are focusing with the estimation of the harmonics. But if you come to the Fourier transform, we say it is useful for a periodic signal where we want to focus with the uh, e extraction of the frequency content of a signal. Okay. So, now in this case, you can see that it is cyclic periodic in the sense my Fourier spectrums, what we are going to see for a non stationary signal will not be a continuous spectrum. It will be again discrete spectrum because of the cyclic nature of this. this. So, within this cycle, it uh, is a non stationary, but if I take within the observation interval of 10 seconds, the same cycle is repeated, therefore, it is an example for cyclostationary. Then, for this type of signal, your Fourier transform spectrum looks like a discrete, but you feel that no, no, I have to, I have to get you only continuous spectrum because in the class I studied. So, therefore, we must know what type of signal that you are going to process. So, that is one, one of the uh, example for a cyclostationary. So, now look at the some speech sound produced by a human. So, now you can see that speech also follows some characteristics. So, now you can know that the frequency information from each of the speaker or each of the person will be different. Now, you can have speaker identity or you can say that your pitch period play a major role and which will be used for classifying male speech and female speech. More specifically, the female speech will have more pitch frequency than the male speech. So, now which is based on the flow 
but what we have to 2 millisecond to 20 millisecond. Now, the case of speech analysis, our observation goes to 30 millisecond, but in the case of cardiac signal processing, my observation is going to 10 second. So, that is that is called a short term analysis. That means what? We have many types of system in the world. It can be a mechanical system, electrical system or any kinds of system. Each of the system has one characteristic to change its behavior with respect to time. The rate at which changes its characteristics in terms of amplitude variations, in terms of frequency variation that will decide what will be the short term analysis. Okay. So, in some applications you will find the variations because you see you take my speech, if I say A, you will get some kind of uh, phonetic sound. If I say L, you can see two types of phonetical sounds, a consecutive. So, now you want to extract a phonetic sounds for L, you looks like two sounds. Now, you have to perform a short term analysis. So, now based on this uh, dynamics of the most of the system, you have to choose what are, what, what will be the uh, period of the short term analysis. So, cardiac signal, I have taken examples of what is called 200 to 300 millisecond, we can expect the new the QRS complex, but in the case of speech, we are taking up to 30 milliseconds. That is a very important characteristics we can observe from the uh, uh, signals. Now, in addition to this cyclostationary quasi state, we must also know what do you mean by monocomponent non stationary signal and multi component non stationary signal. This is also very important information. If you want to be a good researcher in the field of signal passing, you must know what do you mean by monocomponent non stationary and what do you mean by uh, multi component non stationary. I know how to define non stationarity of the signal based on the statistical orders. That means what? If I take a small portion of the signal, and if I estimate all ensemble statistics or temporal statistics, uh, if I repeat the same thing for the next block, if the statistical parameters vary with respect to the time, we can say it is a stationary. If the statistical parameters for each of the blocks do not vary with the time, then we can say a stationary signals. Now, it is all order of the statistics, therefore, we say fixed sense stationary but it is not possible in a practical. Therefore, in some of the courses in communications, we study WSS, weekly sense stationary, big sense stationary. That means what? It obeys only few order of the statistics, not order, all order of the statistics. So, similarly, so I must know what you mean by mono component. So, if, we'll, if you take a spectrum of a speech signal, the speech sound, and if I see the spectrum, the, for this sound, it is localized in this location. Similarly, if I take a spectrum spectrum for this lap and dub sound and this lap and dub sound spectrum is localized to the lower side and this is called murmur, it is produced by the uh, uh, by the heart when turbulence of the blood flow and that will have a higher spectrum. That means what? The spectrum of this heart sound signal includes two spectrum, two narrow band spectrum. One narrow band spectrum for lap sound and dub sound another narrow band spectrum for a murmurs. So, now if you find any signal having a multiple narrow spectrum, then we can say it is called multi component non stationary signals. Non stationary signal means it will contain many frequencies, but if you want to say it is a multi component, then you are going to see that multiple narrow spectrum in the Fourier spectrum of your signals. Okay. So, that is the example for a mono component. Now, why do you want to know this one? If you want to classify any type of signals, first of all we must know whether it is a mono component non stationary or multi component non stationary, because the most important feature that we extract from this type of signal is called instantaneous frequency. You studied in communications also instantaneous frequency, which is sometimes you can say frequency modulation, analog modulation you studied phase modulation studied. So, from the instantaneous phase instantaneous phase, we extract the instantaneous frequency. If you are able to accurately estimate the instantaneous frequency, we are able to classify all kinds of signal in the world, but it is a difficult. So, therefore, we try to convert this type of multi component into a mono component non stationary or uh, then we will apply a Fourier tools to get the instantaneous frequency. So, uh, these are the examples. So, non stationary signals are characterized by time varying spectral content. Signals generated and sampled in time are often analyzed and processed in the frequency domain. Monocomponent signals where there is only one frequency or a narrow range of frequencies 
varying as a function of time. So, these are the examples for mono component. So, if you have hard sound signal, you have murmurs, it will, it will give you a, it will provide another narrow spectrum and uh, you will have another narrow spectrum for a sound S1 and S2. The conventional spectral analysis techniques that assume the signal stationary has failed to give a suitable representation for this type of signals. Now, how do you have a representation for your multi component signals? So, now the multi component signals are mathematically expressed like this x of n is equal to summation k is equal to 1 to k, a k of n e power k pi k of n. So, now a k of n is called instantaneous amplitude and pi k of n is called instantaneous phase. So, in the, in the case of communication system, you like to modulate your signals okay, in order to transmit the signal from the one place to another place or transmit for longer distance. We will modulate based on amplitude, amplitude modulation theory or we can modulate with the frequency modulation theory or we can modulate with the phase modulation theory in the case of analog modulation. So, now in the case of analog modulation particularly amplitude modulation, you will get the envelope AK of N called instantaneous amplitude. In the case of phase modulation, you are seeing the phase variations with respect to time and here we are seeing the amplitude variation with respect to time. If you are able to extract this a k n f y k n which is nothing but a m f m modulated signal. If you record my speech signal or your speech signal, it obeys this a m f m modulation. So, therefore, a m f m modulation features are extensive the speech analysis. So, you can find the different kinds of application where you can use this a m f m modulation features. So now, uh, you collected a signals by using wired sensor, wireless sensor. What are the tasks that we are going to do? The first task that we perform in any kinds of uh, automation system or monitoring system called filtering, which is most important. So, for example, you recorded a brain uh, EEG signals. So, you always find there is a movement of the electrodes. So, that will introduce, introduce some kind of artifacts or when you have uh, EEG electrodes close to eye then blinkings that is called ocular effects. You can see the presence of a electrooculogram in the EEG signals that is called electrooculogram artifacts. Some applications electrooculogram is the diagnostic features, but in the case of EEG, I will treat this type of signal as a physiological interference. So, you will find a physiological interference in any kinds of a biomedical signal. So, in the case of EEG signal, we will see EOG okay, that is called electrooculogram artifacts. Now, that can be removed by designing any kind of a digital filter that we studied in a DSP course. You studied set of your filters like a frequency selective filter, slow pass filter, high pass filter, band stop filter, uh, band pass filter by using any kinds of IR method, FR method. You can design a filter based on the frequency information of electro ocular artifacts and also based on the frequency information of the e brain waves. You can see which is called frequency selective filters. So, now, now we have to have assumptions here. If, if I have a signal which is composition of both noises and the signal, then I must know whether it is a overlapping spectrum or non-overlapping spectrum. That means, I have artifacts or noises that is added to the time domain signal. So, if I see the time domain signal, it is nothing but it is a mixer. You feel that it is difficult to remove this type of artifacts from the time domain signal. But if I apply a Fourier transform on this time domain signal, which includes EEG signal and artifacts, I can see that two different spectrum in the Fourier domain, which is called a out of band noise. Out of band noise means what? The spectrum of your noise is not overlapping with the spectrum of the original signal or EEG signal. So, in such a cases, you can apply frequency selective filters. Okay? So, you must know when to apply the frequency selective filters. If you find my spectrum of a noise is overlapping with the signal, we cannot use type of frequency selective filters what we studied in the SP course, we cannot use it because the spectrum of the original signal is overlapping with the spectrum of the artifacts, which is a challenging problem today also. So, therefore, we have to choose a suitable filtering techniques and then once you remove the artifacts, okay, for example, ocular artifacts or instrumentation noise. So, you are trying to perform some kind of a detection. Now, in the one of the slide, we have seen delta wave, theta wave, alpha wave, gamma wave and beta wave, gamma wave, we have seen. 
So, my application is record EEG signal to detect the presence of the delta wave, which can be a detection problem. So, sometimes it can be a classification problem. That means, I will get a EEG signal, I will classify that EEG signal into any one of the categories based on some features, based on some features. That is very important. What type of features that we are going to use? That is a research. So, now in this case, I you know, in one in the previous slide, I know that each of these local waves are defined with some frequency range 0 to or 1 to 4, 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 12, 12 to or we can say 13 to 30, then above 30. So, frequency information is well defined. Now, I can just take a, a DFT of a recorded EEG signal or what we studied first Fourier transform of a EEG signal. Now, I know the frequency information for each of the waves. Now, you can easily convert DFT coefficients index into a frequency based on the sampling rate of the signal. Now, each of the coefficients in the DFT indicates the magnitude of mag magnitude corresponding to that frequency. Now, it is zero to it is one to four hertz. Now, I know what I know the range of a DFT index. Now, I'll extract only that range of the DFT index. I'll set the zero to the rest of the DFT index. Then I'll apply inverse DFT. I can get only that waveform. Assuming that my local, uh, my brain waves are not overlapping, but it is well studied from the previous slide, we can see that there is no much overlapping among the brain waves. So, therefore, we can use a DFT directly to extract any kinds of a local waves of the or we can say brain waves of the EEG signals. So, that can be a detection problem and there are some applications you have to locate. For example, in a continuous EEG recordings, you will find some kind of epilepsy some kind of seizure. It occurs, uh, but it's rarely for some reasons of a, or malfunctioning of the brain systems. And we want to know, not only detect the epileptic seizure, we want to know the timings of that one also. So, there are some applications you want to perform localization in addition to detection. Then there are some applications you want to classify. For example, I will use brainwave signals to classify the emotion of a person. So, it can be neutral, happy, sad, or some other emotions. It is a classification problem. You record EEG signal with the wireless sensing system and then by extracting some set of features based on some signal processing techniques, you will train with the any kinds of your machine learning techniques including deep neural network nowadays and then you can classify into any one of the uh, class uh, emotion class that is uh, neutral uh, or we can say sad or happy. So then prediction, some applications we want to predict based on the past events. That's called prediction problem. In addition to this, we want to perform data reduction because uh, we are collecting a signal with a sampling rate, the Nyquist sampling rate. Sampling rate. Because it produces uh, uh, too many samples collecting for a low frequency with component as compared to the high frequency Nyquist components. Sampling now, rate. because there will be some redundancy samples collecting a low frequency component as compared to the high frequency components. Now, because there will be some redundancy samples collecting a low frequency component as compared to the high frequency components. Now, because there will be some redundancy samples collecting a low frequency component as compared to the high frequency components. Now, because there will be some redundancy samples collecting a low frequency component as compared to the high frequency components. Now, because there will be some redundancy samples collecting a low frequency component as compared to the high frequency components. Now, because there will be some redundancy samples collecting a low frequency component as compared to the high then instead of transmitting 500 samples per second, I will transmit only few coefficients, few coefficients for example 100. That means what? I can store only the 100 coefficients represent a EEG signal with the 500 samples. Similarly, I can transmit only 100 coefficients. That means what? I can reduce the what is called energy consumption of your wireless radio in a continuous monitoring applications and also I can improve the efficiency of the onboard memory because limited battery. So, I can reduce the what is called um, data that need to be stored and also data need to be transferred based on some kind of uh, transform based techniques. Now, uh, we must also check the quality because you recorded signals and that signals may be always corrupted. It can be what is called a noise free signal or it can be a noisy signals. Now, I studied many signal processing techniques to extract the features. Now, uh, I, if I extract the features from the noisy data, I may classify the abnormal event into a normal event or abnormal event into an abnormal event. Or I may classify abnormal event into a normal and abnormal also because of the noise. Because all the noise, most of the noise in the world for any kinds of signal recording always overlap. That is a challenging problem today. So, how to extract the robust features from the uh, 
uh, signals by using any kind of a techniques. That is also a challenging problem, how to extract the robust feature. Now, instead of extracting a features from a severely corrupted EEG signal, we would like to discard from the further processing, which can reduce the false alarm in the case of diagnostics, which is applicable for any domain. I even I have automatic speech recognition system and I can I cannot use this system while travel or, uh, or traveling by the train. Train is train noise is very heavy and you try to use your ASR, it will not give good translation from speech to text. So now instead of processing it because every processing on a device consumes some energy, I will just discard the noisy signals. So that means what I can save the energy and or I can say I can extend the uh, lifetime of the battery and also I can improve the false alarm reduction ratio. So that is the application of the quality assessment. Now this slide summarizes all the signal processing which are published in the literature. Okay, so now I grouped all the signal processing in time domain techniques studied in universities, frequency domain which also studied. Then there are some advanced signal processing techniques which are called decomposition techniques start with the wavelet transform, then there are some variants of wavelet transform and also a empirical mode decomposition and some variants of the EMD and there are some variational mode decomposition and then today we are going to see sparse signal decomposition. You, you take any signal processing research field and they use only this type of signal processing not eh, away from them. These are the basic signal processing techniques. If you are, if you know all these signal processing techniques, you can do good research and you will get good job also but you have to study, okay. So now, I summarized everything, I should also know what will be the limitation of each of the signal processing techniques. When I do some research, you know, I have to promote my research, okay. I have to promote my research. So I say that I am going to use wavelet transform, then I have to write few things about frequency selective filters in my paper, then only my paper will be accepted, I have to justify, okay. So now, if I say I am going to use time domain which is nothing but a moving average filter which we studied in a huge course. And there is something is called differencing filter, okay, it is called derivative filter. These are the two best examples of, for a DSP course. One is called moving average filter, another one is derivative filter, which we studied in UG. Have you studied, how many of you studied moving average filter? Nobody is raising hand. How many of you studied, please do some exercise. Still we will get the brain to brain communication system, you can use wireless mode, okay, acoustic mode. Have you studied moving average filter? Yes sir, no. Have you studied derivative filter? I am just telling, even my colleague is also here, till today I am using only moving average filter and derivative filter, all my research work published in IEEE. So please do not Ignore the topics which we studied in you. Don't explore deep neural network is the new topics, but it's okay. But still, I am fitting my filter to neural networks. Okay, I'll show one of the slide that deep neural networks nothing but a filter bank theory. What we studied previously, when there is no computing platform. Okay, I'll prove it. So therefore, everyone must understand the meaning of moving, moving average filter and also the meaning of derivative filter. So now, if I say I want to use moving average filter, which is nothing but smooth out all high frequency component present signal, which will be realized as a, realized as a low pass filter. And similarly, derivative filter, which is always used to emphasize the high frequency component that present in the original signal, which is visualized as a high pass filter. Okay, this is the small statement, you can prove it, which is extensively used in most of the real world system today also, because you cannot avoid the presence of thermal noise and that thermal noise can be effectively smoothed out by using moving average filter. No need to design any kinds of IR based frequency selective filter or FR based frequency selective filters. Similarly, derivative filter is extensively used and we also studied in mathematics to find the local maxima. So, most of this event anomalies in the world is a short duration event. The short duration events are very dangerous. Okay, anything, even not, not only this one, in social network also, some short duration of what's that, malicious informations or some false informations can burn in their city also. So every short duration events are much dangerous than 
a longer duration events. The same thing, even a power quality disturbances, a small presence of impulse will uh, damage the high cost equipments. So now, all these short duration events can be effectively detected by using derivative filter only. And also, the derivatives is the best method to understand the spectral estimation. Now, let us come to the spectral estimations, then we will go to the other signal processing techniques. Now, why do you want to estimate the spectrum of a signal? How many of you know? Why do you want to estimate the spectrum? Why do you study Fourier term? You cannot escape from a Fourier. Okay, sometime just back, somebody teased that you do not have scope for that deep is going to do everything. I told, don't worry. Spectrogram is the important, eh, important data for deep neural network. You cannot still escape. Okay, you cannot avoid Fourier in any of the domains. Fourier will be there everywhere. So just tell me. Why do you want to estimate the spectrum? Why do you want to estimate the spectrum? Anyone? Make it an interactive session, otherwise it will be a classroom lecture. Why do you want to estimate? Because most of the signals, particularly the research when you start is a sound based system and other signal, non sound based signal also can be classified with a spectral information. Therefore, A sin omega t plus theta is introduced in mathematics for the purpose that so some of the signal can be represented by using this type of analytical function, basic elementary signals which is studied in signal system. How many of you studied elementary signals in signals and system? Everyone studied, but still you know many of, many of us we do not know how to use. That elementary signals are most important till today in wavelet theory or any signal decomposition. Whatever that 5, five to 6 signal we studied. Okay, a sin omega t e power uh, e power a t. These are two important signal you can see everywhere in the world. Every system will produce uh, either e power say e power a t or sin a sin omega t or combination of these two, nothing else. Any differential equation in the world is used for modeling of any system will have solution with only these three components. Means one component is e power g omega t or you can say e power a t, another one is a sin omega t or combination of these two. So that is why we study, then all the signals in the world or most of the signals in the world can be classified by using spectral information. Now I have a one sinus order signal, how do you estimate the spectrum, how do you estimate the frequency, fundamental frequency, how do you estimate, you have a sinus order signal with a frequency of 100 hertz, coming in real time is given to you, you are asked to estimate what is the frequency of that signal? How do you estimate? That is the second approach. Before that, how do you estimate? Zero crossing detector. Therefore, this is this was studied in a linear integrator circuits. Have you studied this zero crossing detector in operation amplifier circuits? Huh? Speed trigger and zero crossing detector. So, number of cycles per second, number of cycles per second is called frequency, 100 hertz means 100 cycles per second. Now each cycle take exactly two zero crossing, one for positive zero crossing, another one is for negative zero crossing and you are trying to see the number of zero crossings and then you are, you can just detecting the number of zero crossing, you can get the approximate frequency of a signal instead of using Fourier transform in the next domain. The time domain itself by measuring the number of zero crossing, you can do it. But let us assume that two frequency components, one is 100, another one is 1000. That means what? The 1000 hertz component will be superimposed on your 100 hertz signal. Now, if I try to measure the zero crossing for this combined signal, 100 hertz and 1000 hertz, I will get a, a approximate frequency for a 100 hertz component, not for a 1000 hertz, because the 1000 hertz component is superimposed on this. Take a derivative, apply a zero crossing, you will get the approximate frequency of the second component of 1000 hertz. So therefore, derivative, taking a derivative, estimating the number of frequency, the number of zero crossings will be an approximate estimate of the spectrum of a signal. Now if you know that approximate spectrum, you can able to classify any kinds of your signals. The next level, we can use Fourier also to get the spectral content. So the estimation of the spectral content is very important. Now, there are some transform based techniques, filter bank, wavelet transform, empirical, wavelet transform, empirical mode decomposition, these are advanced topics, but
but here I want to just highlight each of the techniques requires some research component. I can I cannot simply blame that I am, I am not going to use time domain filter because uh, it, it, the selection of a filter length is very challenging. But if I if I use a frequency selective filter, there also you have to select what will be the filter order. So sometimes the finding optimal parameters will be the same for each of this application. Maybe parameters will be different, but you cannot escape from the escape from finding a optimal parameters. Every techniques need some optimal parameter determinations. So here you see the wavelet transform which is used for analysis of a non-stationary signal or you can say particularly transient, I need to choose the mother wavelet. If we take a Fourier transform mother wavelet, which will be equivalent to what we studied in a DFT, again with the windowing functions, okay. So different matching means challenges are different in terms of selecting a optimal. So in addition to finding optimal parameters, we must focus with the So now, uh, one of the uh, limitation of all these wearable devices is energy consumption. How do you reduce the energy consumption of your device? So we can use a concept of compressed sensing and by sensing only few measurements, we can process any kinds of anomalies or we can detect any kinds of anomalies. Instead of collecting a, a signal with the Nyquist sampling rate, you are going to take only few measurements from the sensor. That means what you are reducing the number of samples that need to be processed and also that need to be transmitted to the cloud. So if I can reduce the number of samples by using this compressed sensing theory, then I can able to reduce the energy consumption of a processor, I can reduce the energy consumption of the wireless transmitter and also I can save the limited data in a memory. So now. Before understanding the concept of compressed sensing, we must know what you mean by sparse representation. So this is well defined again. You studied Kimball strain, periodic Kimball strain in a, in a DSP and you can see most of the impulse will occur in a short duration. Most of the impulse occurs in a short duration within observation interval. Let us assume that my observation interval is 10 seconds. The impulse are short duration even. It can be in a microsecond, it can be in a millisecond or it can be in nanosecond. You can take old, old audio recordings, when you play back all older recordings, you will get some kind of a spike which is called clicks and pops. If you see the images, you will get a line. Old movies, you are getting lines on your screen, no? Or your desktop. They are called, yeah, impulses. Impulsive nature or you can say impulsive uh, noises, impulsive noises. Now, which are? Uh, which, uh, which, which can be seen in a short duration. Yeah. It's 10 second and assuming that the signal is sampled with a 100, I love 10 into 100. That means what? I love 1000 samples. The impulse are occurred in a short duration. That means each impulse, let us assume that 1 milli or you can say 10 millisecond. Then you will find only a limited number of limited number of non-zero elements in a time domain because let us assume two impulses are occurred in a two different location with a duration of 10 millisecond. Then I allow few samples for this 10 millisecond, few samples, maybe it may be two or three or you can easily compute. It will be assumed that it is five, five. So out of, out of what thousand samples, I am going to see only a, a five, five, ten, ten non-zero elements in a time domain vector. In time domain representation, I am going to see only 10 non-zero elements okay, out of 1000 elements. This is a very important concept. This is called sparse theory. So that means what? You are, 
you are seeing only few non-zero values in a time domain representation of a signal with a length of 1000 samples. So that means the remaining what you say 10,000 uh, minus what is called 10 it will be a yeah then we can say 0. You generate a uh, 50 year signal and it is transmitted due to some problem you will can you will find a impulsive noise in a specific locations. Now it is nothing but what additive mixture of your two sequences one is 50 years signs on signal another one is a impulsive signal both are added that means what linear additive it is a mix of the two sequences you do not know what is the what is called uh, amplitude of each of each of the waveform it is an additive mixture of this that means what only 10 non-zero values you will find the, in the case of a uh, thousand samples that means what this type of signal is localized in the time domain which is very good example with the impulse you have impulse when you try to represent a impulse by using Fourier series or a Fourier transform what will do you are trying to you, you what will what will be the Fourier transform of your impulse how many of you know Fourier transform of impulse? It will be a flat line. That means it contains all the frequencies. That means we have more number of, we need similar number of coefficients to represent the impulse in the time domain. So that means what? A signal is localized in the time domain, but the Fourier is not effective tool for representing a time localized waveforms. Okay. But if I have a sinusoidal signal, if I have a sinusoidal signal, now this sinusoidal signal will have the yes, same number of non-zero elements, the same 10 seconds of sinusoidal signal, sinusoidal is sampled with the 100 hertz, then I will have 1000 samples. So, for a sinusoidal representation of a frequency 100 hertz with a sampling rate of uh, uh, what is called that, uh, with the duration of 10 seconds, sampling rate of 100 will have 1000 samples. So, all we can see that 1000 samples are except few zero crossing, you will get a 1000 samples. That means what this signal it is not localized in the time domain, it is not localized in the time domain. But if I take a Fourier transform of sine wave, what you will get? Impulse, you will get a impulse in the Fourier domain. That means instead of 1000 samples, I will have one impulse in a 1000 coefficients. So that means what a sinusoidal signal which is not localized in the time domain will be localized in the transform domain on the basis function of Fourier series, or you can say e power j omega n. That means what? The time domain signal which we seen it is not sparse in the time domain for example sinusoidal, but it will be sparse in the frequency domain on the Fourier basis, on the Fourier basis it is very important. So, you will see any kinds of signal which can be localized in the time domain or which can be localized in the frequency domain, but most of the real world signals are composite signal which is mixture of both time localized waveform and the frequency localized waveform. Therefore, Fourier is not an effective tool for representing such a time localized and frequency localized waveform. Now, we will give a deep break. After deep break, we will. Thank you, sir.
30 years, silent, that is very important, otherwise tomorrow you will present, my son will talk like this, the reverse, all cyclic phenomena, the way I behaved in my class, same thing I will also get, but you have to be sincere in attending the class, okay. knowledge is most powerful than any other things, gain more knowledge, try to understand, so this is it is well localized in the time domain, but if I apply a DFT that is discrete Fourier transform on this one, I can see that this uh, cycles are well localized uh, close to the zeroth frequency which indicates a low frequency components and the histogram is this one. That means what this signal is localized in the time domain and also localized in the any kind in the any kinds of a transform domain it can be a DFT or a DCT. So, this is the example for a signal localized in the transform domain. So, now this type of signals you have seen in the world this is a good example to understand a slowly varying signal which is the sinusoidal signal which will be localized in the, in the Fourier domain. This is a good example and to understand some spikes slowly varying signal which is the sinusoidal signal in the time domain. It will be localized in the, the Fourier domain. This is a good example and to understand some spikes slowly varying signal which is the sinusoidal signal in the time domain. This will be localized in the Fourier domain. Good example and to understand some spikes slowly varying signal Effectively, the is localized in the time domain. Very very localized the 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 events can be seen in world, and the the signal of um, oscillatory events also can be seen. In the practical applications. Now, for all these uh, applications, how do you extract a, a spike? How do you expect extract this type of uh, pulse waveform? How do you extract this type of a, a oscillatory transient? Because why do you want to extract this type of things? So, as we know that the short duration events are much more dangerous than the slowly varying event because that short duration can have very high frequency components or the short duration events can have a, can have very high amplitude. So, I design all appliances to operate in a specific frequency, I should give a input also with that set frequencies. So, sometimes like my example of delivering lectures, I am giving maybe I am giving very heavy dose or high, high load topics, I should always match with that. So, similarly here it is well designed with the 50 year signal. But if you see a uh, high frequency components it is not matching with the frequency of operation of any appliances and you can see the damages or you can reduce the age of the devices. So, therefore, uh, we have to extract the uh, this type of disturbances to understand what are the frequency components that present in the oscillatory portions or the amplitude you can see sometimes you know uh, 
the sharp high very high amplitude damages of the equipment sometimes hearing it sometimes when switch on your speakers you will get some dope sound okay annoying for us rather than you can present some kind of a slowly wearing signals so these are some kind of dangerous events that are well localized in the time domain which need to be extracted accurately now you take any signal in the world and that can be represented by using some basis function we know that dfd is the best basis function for analysis of your line salt and nature signals you take a speech speech contains many frequency components therefore the speech can be effectively represented by using fourier series component this is called sinus order modeling you are trying to model the speech signal then based on the model parameters you can classify that speech signal or based on the model parameters you can reconstruct the signals so that's the purpose of modeling a signal why do you want to model the signal by using dft equation it is nothing but analysis we are trying to extract the dominant frequency of my speech sound a speech sound b or a sound some word you want to develop something uh, command based uh, door open and close i speak door open it will open based on the frequency content information it will be trained with uh, any machine learning techniques or you can combine with any heuristic rules also so you speak uh, close the door and then frequency component will be different so by using the spectral features of your speech itself you can operate a op uh, what we are we can say to control any kind of appliances or any kind of object so which will have a representation like this that means signal can be represented with the fourier series function we are always trying to find a alpha now you know fourier series signal what is the dft it is based on e power j omega n now this omega if i take a discrete time fourier transform this omega can have a frequencies from the minus pi to plus pi okay minus pi to plus pi within minus pi to plus pi i can have infinite number of frequency components or if i take a time domain if i take a continuous representation it will be minus infinity to plus infinity within that i can have infinite number of frequency component so now if i if i can generate a, a, a sinusoidal waveform from this e power j omega n from 0 to pi with a equal interval of something 0 0.01 0 0.02 pi 0.03 pi up to 1 pi if i generate a 10 sinusoidal waveform now i am receiving a signal which is a eeg signal from the sensor now i'll try to find a frequency component of this that means what yeah, you you have a real world signal having many frequency like alpha theta gamma and let us assume that i have a, a frequency of frequency from 0 to 4 hertz now the elementary waveform which is which we generated like 0.1 0.2 0.3 0.4 up to 1 hertz 1 1 1 pi then you will find a very high correlations for specific values of omega maybe 0.2 maybe 0.4 maybe 0.6 it is nothing but what what we studied a dot product in the class it's called correlation you generate a waveform by using e power j omega and then each of this waveform of point 1 projected on the input signal if the input signal is having the point 1 component i'll get a higher alpha now i i have point 2 component in the input then i'll i have second component is point 2 i'll just projecting projecting means for dot product so you will get a higher value Now let us assume that your elementary can have 0.4, 0.3, sorry, 0.4, 0.5, 0.6, 0.6, but the input signal is not having the component of 0.4, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5. So my alpha value will be small. So it's the best way to realize is what you generated a set of waveforms and you are trying to project on your input signal. Now generation is what restricted with my Fourier series of e power j omega n, but you can also create a elementary waveform. you know set of shapes of your waveforms you store all these set of waves in your dictionary okay it's called dictionary so i i have seen waveform like this today tomorrow something i store all the elementary waveforms as a dictionary and tomorrow i'll use this dictionary to represent my signals in the sense i'll project a first waveform on the original signal i'll get some alpha value second waveform same original signal i'll get some other alpha value then if you find a set of alpha having larger amplitude then you can say that only those frequencies are present in the input signal this is called signal representation which is nothing but what we are studying is a encoding process you generated a or you created a set of elementary waveforms 
by using a mathematical expression or you generate a set of elementary waveforms by using a, a real world signals. So, here your matrix can be constructed by using mathematical expression or matrix can be constructed by using real world signals. Then you are trying to find the similarity between these two waveforms. You will get higher similarity means it is matching. That means that input signal is having a component of the particular elementary waveforms in this. That is completely represented by using this expression. So, now uh, the complete main focus of this presentation is how to reduce the energy consumption of this. Now, we must know what are the different models of your wireless biosensor node. Basic is, basically, we have analog front end module and microcontroller and wireless module. So if you look at the energy consumption, you will have, you need energy consumption for data acquisition, microcontroller and wireless and memory, the basic block data. Now, if you, uh, if you visualize the energy consumption in the order, then data storage required less energy consumption compared to the data acquisition, data processing, data transfer. Now, if you are not doing any processing on the wearable devices, then you can say that the data energy consumption for a data transfer is much, con, much higher than the energy consumption required for data processing. But nowadays, we want to do all the computations on the edge computing platform. That is a new topic nowadays. In the, that means, instead of sending a signal to the cloud, you will do all the computation at the edge level or on the device level. Because you, you want to timely detect the event or timely diagnose the type of disease. Instead of sending the cloud, that means what? You need a reliable communication network. You need a, a data rate also, high bandwidth. So now, instead of that, I can do all the computations. I can timely predict the event, timely detect the event, or I can timely diagnose the specific anomalies. So that is possible based on the recent advancement in the edge computing platform. Now, edge computing is the, it has some advantages as compared to cloud computing in terms of the privacy and security and less latency. But the problem is that energy consumption because you are going to compute everything on the on portable device or edge devices and with they are limited with the battery. But cloud always having connect or you can say cloud is always connected with your uh, energy sources. So, therefore, you must know how to reduce the energy consumption. But if I increase the processing on the device or edge level, then we, we should interchange this. That means energy consumption for data processor is much higher than the energy consumption required for data transmission. So, now how do you calculate this is a, a simple model for energy budget. If I want to use this type of wearable devices or this type of devices, then it will be EA plus EB plus ET plus ES. This is the simple energy budget. So, processing, acquisition, transmission and storage. Now, the traditional wireless sensor node includes the analog front end, then analog to digital converter, then we will perform data compression, noise removal, signal quality assessment, parameter extraction, then we will also do encryption of the data and then we will store the data after processing and also we will transmit the encrypted data to the cloud. This is the simplest block diagram of any of the wireless sensor node in the world. Today, if you open any wearable devices, it contains only these modules. Now, I can, I may focus in the design of analog front end, I may focus with the design of ADC or I will work in the field of data compression or I will work in the field of noise removal, signal quality and parameter extraction or I will design a new type of processor with, with the low power and or I will work with the data security okay, or which is nothing but a data encryption and or I, I will work with the low power high data rate wireless radio. So, now with this block diagram you can understand uh, different research components. So, now in assume that we have a low power uh, processor, low power high speed processor, we have a low power high data rate wireless radio and then we have low power high resolution ADC which is available market nowadays. But even if you have low power high resolution ADC, low power high data rate wireless radio and uh, low power high speed processor, then the continuous processing of a signal uh, will lead to a frequent charging of your devices. Okay, therefore, we have to perform some kind of a task okay, on, on the processor level to reduce the energy consumption. Now, what do you mean by compressed sensing? 
the compressed sensing is a novel data question technique which operates the sampling rate much lower than the Nyquist sampling rate. That means that is the benefits of compressed sensing. That means you are trying to uh, uh, perform a sampling and compression of a signal at the same time. So what we have seen in the previous block, we collected a signal by using ADC. Now I want to transmit this data to the cloud. Then I have to perform a data compression before transmission so that I can reduce the energy consumption. That is the first traditional methods. Now in the case of compressed sensing, you are going to get a only you are going to get a only few measurements. That means limited data to represent the same signal while sensing itself. You are performing a compression. That's called. Therefore, it is called compressed sensing. You have to sense the data that required a data question model, or you can say that required a ADC. And also, you have to perform a data compression because it is the energy consumption of the wireless radio. Now, I have to find a, a mechanisms, or you can say a type of a techniques can enable data compression and data question at the same time which is extensively used in many of the wireless sensor nodes. Okay. That means it can reduce the energy consumption by achieving data accretion and data compression. So now this is the block diagram of uh, uh, analog compressed sensing based by signal sensing module. So that means what instead of ADC, we will have analog compressed sensing module. So now that means here uh, in the previous block diagram, this this is nothing but yeah, the analog to digital converter which operate with the, the Nyquist sampling rate, but this one will operate with the S rate. That means we can say measurement rate of 1 by 10th of the Nyquist rate, which is possible only for a signal which satisfies the parsity which you have seen in the previous slide. If the, if the signal is not a sparse signal, then you cannot use a compression sensing concept. You should to see a type of signal which can show some number of sparsity and that parsity number should be much much lesser than the total length of the signal. Assume that the length is n, the sparsity is k, then k should be far far less than the number n. Then only you can apply this concept of compressed sensing. Now, so there are uh, two types of uh, realization of a compressed sensing. That means I can use a compressed sensing concept in a digital domain for data reduction purpose. That means what? In this case, I will use a traditional analog to digital converter, then I will use the concept of a digital compressed sensing. In the sense, I will implement only this expression where y is equal to pi into x, where x is the discrete time signal, pi is the sensing matrix and y is the measurement. Then the length of the measurement is m and the size of this uh, uh, what is called sensing matrix will be m cross n and the x is the length of the signal n is the length of the signal. Now, this is nothing but what it is a just multiplication of a uh, what is called signal and the elementary waveforms, a simple multiplication. Now, I want to use this one for compressing a signal or particularly compressing a discrete time signal. Therefore, this is called a digital compressed sensing, digital compressed sensing. That means, I will use a traditional ADC, get the high resolution data. Why do you want to use this? ADC for this type of biomedical applications because most of the abnormal events uh, occurs in yeah, some specific instant of time or rare events. So now if you try to apply compressed sensing, even though many literature shows that you can reconstruct exactly if you choose a suitable sensing matrix with the suitable basis function, but uh, there is always a possibility of missing the diagnostic information because it is all rare, rare events will not be seen frequently. It is some type of inf information occurs in a, in a man in a for, for example 10 days or in a one day or in a 10 hours. So in such a cases we should have a high resolution data question module so that we are able to get a very or we can say high resolution events. So now once you get the high resolution events you can explore the compressed sensing because already the high resolution data is stored but still I want to reduce the energy consumption of the deep neural network architecture or I want to reduce the energy consumption of wireless module, I can implement this one. Now one can argue here, shall we implement a traditional transform based data compression techniques because we studied many data compression, lossy compression, lossless compression. 
Now, I can also do the compression of a, a discrete time signals by using any kinds of classic techniques. Like I can use a DCT, I can use wavelet transform to compress the signals. Now, in all this DCT or wavelet transform, you have to perform a, a what is called some kind of a, a integer multiplications. Yeah, multiplications. Now, you can see that if I use DCT, so the matrix pi pi is nothing but a DCT matrix and x is the input signal and the size of this DCT matrix will be n cross n, where n is the length of the signal. I will just project, I will get a y, I will get a y, y is nothing but DCT coefficient, y is the DCT coefficient which will have a length of n, which will have a length of n. So now, this implementations required multiplications is an integer multiplications and also requires a what is called uh, uh, additions, integer additions. So now, in the case of compressed sensing, if I can explore a suitable sensing matrix in a binary representation, that means what? I will use this pi, which is, which is a sensing matrix based on the binary data. That means what? This pi contains only zeros, zeros and 1, contains only 0 and 1. So now, instead of performing multiplications, get my y, I can just do the comparison of 0 and 1, then wherever 1 we have, you will add only that coefficient, only that samples. So that means we are avoiding the multiplication, the hardware implementation, because multiplications uh, requires much more energy than the addition process, the comparison process. Got it? So otherwise, if, if it is, this pi is generated based on non-binary matrices like a random noise, Gaussian noises, it is a non-binary. That means you have to multiply every non-binary with your x to get the y. But if I generate this by by using only 0 and 1, then I can just check the value of that binary vector. Okay, each column vector is the binary vector. I will see the location of 1, then only that value will be added. If I say I will see the location of 1, then you are going to, in a digital electronics, you are going to design a comparator. You will see whether this input is is either 0 or 1, if it is a 1, you are going to add the samples and you will get a y. So that means what, it is reducing the computational complexity or you can say computational hardware complexity of the system or you can say reduce the energy consumption. Now, we have very, uh, we have many sets of uh, sensing matrices, binary sensing matrices. One is called random binary sensing matrix, random fixed binary sensing matrix, then we have deterministic block binary sensing matrices. So now, and also random Bernoulli sensing matrices. So if I take a random fixed binary, that means what? I will have fixed number of ones each of the rows. That is called random fixed binary. But the location of the ones will be any any position in the column vector, or sorry, row vector. Now in the case of a random binary sensing matrix, in each of the row, I will have different number of ones. Each of the row, I will have different number of ones. In the case of a deterministic block binary sensing matrix, each row, I will have specific number of ones. And I also, I know the location of the ones. For example, diagonal in the sense, let us assume that two, uh, three ones, three consecutive ones, one, one, zero, 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 five zeros are there. Then next, ne next row will have one from fourth locations to 4, 5, 6, then third row will have 6 from to 9. So that means what? You are seeing a consecutive ones in a diagonal of that matrix. Therefore, it is the example for a what is called deterministic block binary. Now, if I if I see the a fixed number of binary, if I see the random binary sequence, you, are, you have to perform the comparison of each of the values of the row. So, either, either 1 or 0, then you are adding. But in the case of a deterministic matrix or we can say block binary deterministics, no need to compare because I know the location of the binaries. So, 1, 1, one so first 3 values if I add, then again if I add the 4th and 5th and 6th value, I will get a second value. If I add a 7 and 8 and 9, so then I will get a third values. I can repeat till I that number of rows. If I have 10 rows, the first three values added, the second one 4 and 4, uh, 4, 5, 6, then third one is 6, sorry, 7, 8, 9, and then 10, 11, 2, I can just add it, no comparison required. 
So now it is this uh, what is called deterministic block binary can further reduce the multiplication process. There is no multiplication process if I use a deterministic block binary. So now that means what we are going to reduce the overall energy consumption of sensing hardware because the sensing hardware is always with your transmitter. Then once you get the measurement at the receiver, particularly for satellite applications, you cannot always uh, energize the satellite, but you want to use the same battery for longer duration, particularly satellite, but you can, you can, you have so much energy in the ground station, then if you use this compressed imaging hardware on the satellite and you can send only few pixels to the ground station, you can reproduce the same yes, with a few measurements. If that images, image shows sparsity in any one of the basis function. Therefore, this compressed sensing uh, or a signal, compressed imaging becomes most popular for a satellite applications. Actually, the research was started for MRI. You feel that, that uh, when whenever you go for MRI scanning, okay, once I went for my diagnostics, you feel, sometimes you will get afraid because that machine will operating from another room and you will be that machine. Since I studied something, I know control system, all this thing. After going, I will feel uh, this fault, I will die like this, I will think. It's panic, longer duration. Sometimes the scanning is not good. He has to produce more uh, pixels to get the good quality. But just imagine a baby, okay? So therefore, uh, the great persons, doctors reported one of the person, colleagues that, shall we reproduce the original MRI images if I produce a few samples of a one? So he did not know how to solve, he went to a, a mathematicians, okay? he got a field medalist award and closed his room and he started solving this problem. Now I can say more than 1 lakh PhD was in because of it. But he closed the room, he solved that problem, come up with the solution. Yes, you can reconstruct the same higher resolution with surface super resolution because of the sparse recovery. So you can reproduce the same MRI if you can generate only few pixels. So that is the history of this compressed imaging. So satellite you can imagine. Therefore, Texas Instruments started single pixel camera. So single pixel camera you go through it. And well laboratory introduced lensless camera. You will find the device next generation. There will not be no lens. So they use aperture principle of the screen and they will get your images. So these are because of the growth in this type of technology compression sensing concept. Okay. With this, so I, I covered all the different. So now, what type of uh, properties that need to be satisfied when you say that you are able to reconstruct or recover the original signal from the few measurements? It has to, uh, we have to check the, we have, or we have to create some kind of your conditions. So because one can argue that I will also come up with the, some sensing matrices. So everyone can do, I can propose. But still, we are not able to replace the Fourier basis function. But still, you can come up with, I will come up with a new type of sensing matrices. But you cannot expect that you can reproduce the uh, original signal with the few measurements. If I can have some set of properties, that is very important properties called restricted isometry property and also a yeah, mutual coherence property. So now, I can just slightly introduce two a concept we studied. One is called L0 norm, L2 norm, L1 norm and L infinity norm. If you know the meaning of uh, four norms, you are expert in any of the domain. Because some infinite norm is placed in a control system. We studied L0 norm. What is the meaning of L0 norm? The L0 norm is nothing but finding a number of non-zero values. But it's a kind of, the, how do you find? Then L1 norm, it is nothing but is absolute and add. L2 norm is extent used in all minimum problem, the mean square minimum problem. And then L infinity norm to get the maximum values of the given vector. So each of the norm, all four norms have specific application. Now, we have to satisfy the important properties, how much smoothness that you want when you want to reconstruct the original signal from the few measurements. How much sparseness that you want. The smoothness can be obtained if you try to have a mean square problem, that is, you always find the equilibrium distance. So we have original signal and then we have some predicted signal 
we will try to find the difference between original reconstructor then we will square it ok that called mean square problem. Find the error then square it and then find the mean that called mean square error. Try to minimize the mean square in such that get the best optimal parameters to reconstruct the original signal or to predict the original signal the few samples it's called minimization problem or we can say it is called it is a condition for guaranteeing the smoothness of the of the reconstruct signal. Now what will be the sparseness it should be L1 L0 finding the number of non zeros or number of zeros yeah, in a in a for a signal having a sparsity in the some transform domain. So now by adding these two term sparseness term and smoothness term they come up with the solutions called basis basis pursuit called L1 optimization where where there is a lambda which controls how much smoothness that you want in the re, for the reconstruct signal or how much sparseness you want. Sparseness means I want only few coefficient and so that I can reproduce the original signal. So how much smoothness, how much sparseness that is controlled by the lambda which is nothing but regularization parameter in the case of the reconstruction of your original signal from a few measurements. Now if I am if I can find a mutual concurrence between the a basis function that is psi and also a measurement matrix then based on this also I can know how many measurements that need to be taken because you are saying that I have a signal which is which is having a, a, a sparsity in the transform domain. So for a signal of a 100 samples I have a sparsity of 10 that means k value is 10 and the number of sample is 100. Now how many measurement I have to take I have to consider so that I can reproduce the original signal. You have to bring some relations between the number of samples of your original signal and also the sparseness value. Here k is equal to 10, the number of samples is 100, then you have to choose any values greater than 100, sorry, greater than 10, less than 100. Then only you can say I can compress the signal in the time domain. Now we have to find some relationship. Based on this relationship, we can come up with what will be the values of values of the m. So now, yeah. so if I take this one, so if I satisfy this one that means m should be greater than uh, t into k log n by k where n is the length of the signal, k is the sparsity of the signal Then with this relations can able to reconstruct the original signal from few measurement. Therefore, they can say that by using L1 optimization and we can recover the original signal exactly with a high probability if my m is greater than this then only we can have the reconstruct signal with the, with the less error reconstruct signal with the less error similarly there is a condition for a mutual coherence property all these things yeah so after applying a compressed sensing we can have a different type of signals then here we are trying to see uh, is it possible to reconstruct my uh, original EEG signal from only 120 measurements? So this is the original signal with a sample number of 250. Then we have taken some divide by 2. So we, we got 125 measurements. Then we apply L1 optimizations, get the reconstruct signal. Both original signal and the reconstruct signal plotted here with the red is reconstructed and blue is the original. And then error is uh, plotted here. Then from this error within the range of minus 1 to plus 1, you can say that with 125 measurements, I can reproduce the same signal with the 250 samples. Now, we further reduce to 250 and then still you can see that it is going to reproduce. That means what? Instead of generating a 250 samples per second, I can assume that it is a 1 second, then I can generate only 50 measurements. Okay, that means what? That much amount of, amount of energy can be reduced. And also, if I generate a 50 measurement, if I can prove that from this 50 measurement I am able to reproduce the original signal, then I can say every measurement is the information. But here every samples, okay, in the time domain signal may not be information. Even if I miss a one sample, I can interpolate, I can get the original signal in the NICO state. May not be a information, that may not be missing information. But in this case, Every measurement is a will play a major role in reconstructing the original signal. Therefore, the measurement is called information. Therefore, Texas instrument design a new what is called data equation model analog to information converter 
instead of analog to digital converter. They have many product with the analog to digital converter with the Nyquist sampling rate, but after invention of this type of technology, they also design a hardware for analog to information converter because every measurement carries some information about the signal. So now if I say every measurement carries the information, now instead of training a deep neural network architecture with 250 samples, I can train the deep neural ne network architecture with only 50 measurements. By doing this way, I can reduce the number of operations required okay, for the particular trained model and also model size required for particular trained model. So therefore, you can see that this compressor sensing going to play a major role in reducing the energy consumption of the deep neural network architecture. Okay. Because here you are trying to use 250 samples for the same type of uh, arrhythmias or we can say uh, uh, brain waves and here you are going to use only 50. Obviously, you will not lose uh, or, or you will not get the, uh, what is called higher reduction in the accuracy because we are trying to demonstrate here it is going to capture all the information. So, if this is satisfied and you showed in your paper, you can simply use only 50 measurements for training your deep neural network to classify whether it is a what is called neutral emotion or a happy emotion or a sad emotion or you can use it for detecting any epileptic seizure. That means what? It will also reduce the latency. The processing speed will be much higher because we are going to use only few measurements. Each measurement carries the information. Therefore, you can see the analog to digital converter that's in the market. So, uh, just all these algorithms, you can find it, you can just search our paper, you will get. So, now I will just show. Actually, this is, this is the framework we proposed. Okay, many people are using it. It is from our research work. Nobody made a framework for a signal, for signal decomposition. So, here I demonstrated in this paper, I demonstrated the importance of your impulse in the dictionary, so which is applied to many domains. Ah, yeah. So, you see, uh, this is the signal, uh, like a sun salt signal, you will find some uh, few uh, spikes. Now, if I use Fourier series or wavelet transform, which will not capture the complete information of a sinusoidal waveform because the uh, wavelet transform will have a band information. There will be always a spectral leakage. If I use a Fourier series, may be suitable for extracting the complete sinusoidal information but may not be suitable for extracting the, the impulse noise because extraction of impulse noise in a Fourier series required all coefficients. But that means what if I say all coefficients, it will include the coefficients of the sinusoidal also. That means what if I try to recover impulses, then I will get the presence of the sinusoidal also. We cannot avoid. Partial information of the sinusoid will be there in the extracted one. But if I use the power signal representation by using my dictionary, where the dictionary includes a sinusoidal waveforms and also impulse waveforms. That is the one we have seen this uh, matrix. Yeah, this is the matrix. So it will have an identity matrix which is nothing but an impulsive waveform and then sine and cosine. Sine and cosines will, will capture a frequency localized waveforms in the signal and the impulsive or we can say impulse or identity waveforms will capture the time localized waveform. So therefore, your dictionary size is increased and then you will have more number of columns than the number of rows. Okay, you will have more number of columns because you are padding any elementary waveforms is not equivalent to the length of the signal. Therefore, you cannot you, you cannot get the, the optimal coefficients directly just projection. Okay, therefore, we have to look for this type of uh, optimization techniques where we have uh, better sparseness and better smoothness. So now by using this one, you can see that this impulse having a positive amplitude exactly captured and similarly this Im impulse having a negative amplitude or you can say negative polarity is exactly captured and sinusoid also captured. Now one of my MTech students, he applied the same theory for audio in painting. That means he downloaded many videos from YouTube and you will find all old videos will have some clicks and pops. When you play it, you tum sounds. They are very short duration impulsives. The digitized audios of your old audio, old audios or old movies. You will you'll get some kind of lines in the images. That is called image in painting. Okay? 
will apply the same concept to remove that uh, lines in the images is called image in painting. Similarly, if you if you see a speed signal or a digitized signal of audio, you will find this type of spikes in the old recordings which is called digital restoration. So, he applied and he removed all the clicks and then we embedded to the original video, we played to many people, they perceived that it is a good quality. But still it was started in 2014 when we do not have much computing hardware, it took 5 days to convert one video, but nowadays we are running much faster. So, now we are trying to convert all YouTube videos, particular old videos having this problem clicks based on this type of techniques. So, now this is one of the application of this. And another one is you see there is some transient is superimposed and another type of transient, here you see this transient oscillatory transient includes a fast varying cycles in a for few seconds, so few uh, duration and then you have a, a long uh, cycles. So, now if I use wavelet very difficult to capture both this uh, what is called long duration cycles and the uh, short duration cycles in a single sub band. You will find this will be in a uh, detail bands of 1 and this may be in the second band. So, therefore, wavelet is an effective tool to detect the transient, but not an effective tool to extract the uh, morphological information. Morphological is important because any world in the recognition need a morph. Morph means some kind of uh, what is the frequency content or a shape of the signal. Based on the shape only we are classifying the many people, color. Based on the color, shape, we are classifying objects, no. Similarly, which are called morphological parameters. If you find a, any techniques can extract the morphological content of this type of signal, you can accurately detect or accurately analyze a, such a type of transients. So, you see sometimes buried spikes also extracted and here we can see. So, uh, same sensor signal superimposed with the positive uh, polarity symbols event and when I apply a wavelet method, first detail contains the portion of the given impulse. That means, I can use wavelet for detection purpose, but the second band also has a partial information of this impulse. And then if I use this parts representation, it, it exactly extract the positive polarity with the higher amplitude, negative polarity with the lower amplitude, which cannot be done by using wavelet transform. This way if you demonstrate your work and it will be accepted and you will get some money also. Please do not expect that always as a paper. You prove it and uh, if you can demonstrate you buy your software. So, that is very important. So, this is yeah, you see the slowly varying drip and which is extracted by using this parse representation. And this, this is the EG, ECG signal corrupt, corrupted with some kind of yeah, artifacts. So, now I want to perform a EEG signal decomposition by using parse signal. So, now I will construct a dictionary for a delta wave beta wave, alpha wave, beta wave and then I apply a sparse signal decomposition, then I will get a setup band. Now, in this case, we do not have much uh, what is called uh, much components for baseline monitor and power line components. Then we can see delta wave, theta wave, alpha wave, beta wave and then we are trying to show that this original signal is completely reconstructed if I add all these uh, waveforms, decomposed waveforms. Now, if I can estimate the frequency for this or if I estimate the energy or if I apply a entropy, then I can say which wave is prominent in the first signal. Now, if you know which wave is prominent in the first signal, then you can able to detect a uh, people who is sleeping in the classroom or people uh, sleeping while driving. So, therefore, decomposition of a signal is most important and by and also we have to suppress the power line interference and the baseline monitor. So, this case you can see the same ECG signal, the EEG signal, it drifted from the 0th line, so the drifted one. Then if you, if you apply a sparse signal decomposition, you can get the drifted waveform and power line interference delta. So, that means what by considering only delta, theta, alpha and beta and their features, I can classify the EEG signal by discarding the baseline monitor this. That means what in a single decomposition, you are able to do all the tasks which cannot be done with the other signal processing techniques which are listed in one of the slide. Only sparse signal you are able to single signal processing framework where you can extract the baseline monitors, power line interference and also a set of brain waves including delta 
theta, alpha, beta. Now you extract the features from this and you can feed your deep neural network or any machine learning, you can perform any classification, okay. So now here also we can apply a sparse network, okay. We can see deep neural network, you are giving a raw data or a filtered data. Instead of that, I will feed only a coefficients to my deep neural network, it becomes sparse network. You are giving only sparse coefficients to your deep neural network instead of giving a raw data this. So here also you can see some baseline pointers. So here you can see demonstrate, yes, the same techniques can be used for removal of power line interference. You cannot avoid this interference in any of the recording devices because your recording devices includes detectors and capacitors. Always you will see the presence of electromagnetic components. So you can always see the power line interference, which can be eliminated by designing analog filter like a notch filter. But some of the applications we will not do, we will do it in the digital domain. In this case, we can see that by using same parse signal decomposition techniques, you can baseline wander. Here baseline wander is, uh, there is no baseline wander. Here we have power line interference. This way we can demonstrate the application of your proposed technique. So uh, with this, I will conclude my presentation. If I any questions, you can ask me. Any questions? I know uh, this is still advanced topics, but still you can know the terminologies. Any questions from Thank you. Huh? Actually, uh, I started sparse signal uh, decompositions. And I started with the power quality. There are some work was done to me uh, for home appliances. Shall we check the quality before giving to our uh, home appliance product? So I started. The patterns were generated for, but at a stage I found that it is very useful. Then I come up with the framework, and uh, they are extensively using for biomedical. But except my students, uh, nobody published this framework. Because uh, this is most powerful techniques. That time, not much uh, uh, high speed computer, but nowadays it is running faster. Because the reconstruction from the measurements is a uh, computationally expensive task. Therefore, I told satellite applications. Similarly, if you have EEG signal, this is the single framework where you can remove baseline artifacts or ocular artifacts and also uh, power line interference. And then you can separate all the brain waves, single framework. So, you can see with this well, available in not study for E, but just because I started another direction that because everyone is working in deep neural network, no? Everyone wants to do something with the deep neural network. So everyone is using raw data, everyone is using spectrogram. So, I am slightly changing into compressed DNN. So, so I am trying to prove it, all the domains we, we, have, we have completed for uh, ECG, particularly we started with the cardiac signal. You feed only measurements, still accuracy is good, but we have got uh, so much reductions in the memory size and also number of operations. You can extend that direction also. Every time we have to introduce some new field, okay, otherwise if everyone is going with the deep neural network, it is not necessary that you have to follow deep neural network. Because that one of the work I, I forgot to demonstrate, not that you always follow the deep neural network. You should also know how to use signal processing techniques. And all the signal processing techniques will empower the deep neural network. Because 
blindly using you say that i'm going to train okay it's so one classical problem you you want to perform a emotional classification by using eeg signal or you want to recognize a, a person by using eeg signal but assume that that eeg signal is always corrupted with the various kinds of noises and artifacts is there any way or is there time to generate or create a database all kinds of noises and artifacts that exist in the world in a deployment scenario not possible so if you use any database and training with a deep neural network with a raw data don't do it do filter one that means what filtering of a signal because you know what is alpha theta gamma what is the frequency range and perform the filtering that will reduce the burden in creating a database that people are not doing it i don't know why uh, they are not thinking different way so because see you cannot cover if we say that my is 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 signal is always corrupted with the muscle artifacts your uh, in a wrist band your ppg is always uh, corrupted with the motion artifacts and you cannot generate a, such a, such a, what is called wide variety of motion artifacts you see while presenting myself if i am wearing wrist band how many accents i did each accents will introduce a different different motion artifacts if this, those motion artifacts are not trained with my deep neural network do you think that the deep neural network generates some intelligence not not possible even if i show some brinjal to some vegetables to me i cannot tell the what type of vegetable because i did not train same way deep neural network also need a data wide variety of what is called possible variations of the artifacts which cannot be uh, created so therefore we have to look for filter if i say filtered one that means what i know this is the frequency of the signal what is from 1 uh, hertz to 80 hertz brain wave then if i sampled at a 200 hertz then what will be the highest frequency that you can see 100 hertz so then from 80 to 20 you will find n number of noises and artifacts if i follow the filtered one for the deep neural network and you are going to avoid in you you no need to spend to create a noises from 80 to 100 no because it's already filtered it but in practical if you deploy if some sensor is giving a, a, a what is called signal with a with a frequency components of uh, 80 to 100 which is not trained in your system what result will you expect it will not work it will not work there's a practical problem there are two things is research is different innovation is different we should not combine we should not what is called overlap both need okay research will try innovation but innovation will consider the all deployment issues so you can use filtered cnn you can use a compress sensing cnn or compress sensing deep learning neural networks you will get many more many more advantages instead of blindly following what people are doing it same database the one lakh people worked and varying accuracy but still not solving my problem health problem okay so we have to always think in a different way but it's difficult to survive if you think different way that's also a problem so all these things you have to demonstrate you have to demonstrate that you are doing wrong you are doing something wrong here that is way, that is the way you can survive otherwise you know if i tell that everyone is uh, not doing good one the sometimes my paper will go to the same person he may reject it that is also happening in the world but you have to strongly what is called highlight your contribution that's very important that ne that needs only basics fundamental nothing else so again the deep neural network i'll just take one minute okay i just tell what do you mean by deep neural network machine learning deep neural network you have conventional neural network and after that you have pooling layer conventional layer pooling layer you also uh, know what is the patch normalization then you have some flattening layer you will also use some mechanisms to control the weights now you see traditional machine learning also has some pre processing has some feature extraction and some people work particularly the speech group i know they work for speech a uh, feature normalization they work for speech feature reduction with the, using many uh, this one now you see if you just correlate each block of a traditional machine learning with the deep neural network everything is there only deep neural network will have a complete automation in controlling the weights required for that okay 
otherwise you know i have to run my traditional machine learning thousand iterations i may come up with the best features because my objective is to get 99.9 percentage of accuracy for a given data set so this is running in a loop to get optimal feature what is this one conversion neural network is a filter and then what you use the pooling layer what is maximum pooling average pooling you have what is the pooling is a sub sampling it's nothing but a feature reduction nothing but a feature reduction what i done it so i i told no i instead of using my uh, time down signal of 100 samples i'll project with the dft then i'll use sparse coefficient the feature reduction so everything is there in the tradition uh, whatever we studied in a traditional machine learning each blocks are is available in deep neural network in an integrated manner there's nothing so if i do not know what is conventional you know how to choose the filter so you can focus with how to choose the optimal filters number of filters in each conventional layer and number of uh, what you, what is the size of the filter there is something is called stride in conventional layer which is nothing but what block processing what i did it block shifting it's exactly matching nothing is new only it's integrated framework and where i am not going to control but still conventional deep neural network requires optimal parameter otherwise it do not work you will find many research in the group they will use a uh, only r e l u rectified linear unit activation function for all the applications not correct you found that there are what is called exponential linear uh, unit dk r l u there are many activation functions are proposed in the fall studies and each one will have a different accuracies we are not studying it that's also a challenging problem so deep neural network means not just going to solve the problem you have to find a still optimal parameters which is demonstrated for one of the slide each techniques required some kind of research in finding your optimal parameters you cannot escape from that so this is the way we can change cam change because most of the people follow is called transfer learning trained network because you know see you want to something uh, to contribute in research world don't work with all trained networks today is free tomorrow is okay then what is the use of your model i generated a model with the trained network given by some of the companies publicly available the model is good tomorrow if i release the product with that architecture only i have to release because trained model also i need to extract the same deep neural network features i have to use his uh, trained network today he is giving because he is promoting to use it it's kind of addiction okay so try to develop your own network it takes time but it's good because most of the time my students they try to get your own network but uh, most of the expert panel they will always question why you are not using trained networks we kind of facing some problem but it's not problem i'll tell you defend i don't want to use this is the reason you can stop kind of no all the trained network you have to buy tomorrow then what's your what is the use of your model without that trained network you cannot test your model you cannot develop any product so please try to train or create a new architecture if you are able to create a new architectures you are expert in the domain of deep we use a trained network hope for improving our skills in a deep neural network architecture so it is not a block box it is well defined mathematical framework i don't use block box we do not know not it's not a block box well defined it's not that it is replacing a feature engineering no it is also extracting the feature but still the deep neural network need a subject knowledge not a hand crafted features it's also knowledge based feature please remember all this technology then you can do good work you will get a good job and you can be independent you can speak whatever you want that is very important okay any doubts okay thank you we express thank you sir we express our gratitude for your continued participation let this last for the further days with gaining lots of knowledges kind announcement all the participants are requested to attend this upcoming sessions on time without any delay we expect you your kind cooperation the session comes to an formal closure thank you